So of course, we know that concerns about certain chemicals like arsenic and lead and mercury, my goodness, that goes back thousands of years. And then we also know that there were problems with the asbestos and they raise concerns because they've been used in materials and products that increase human exposure and lead to health problems. But beginning in the late 19th century and then accelerating during and after World War II, the industry significantly increased the production of synthetic chemicals. And this was driven in part by the petrochemical industry because they had the lead in technology and innovation. So remember, I mentioned we've got tens of thousands of chemicals on the market worldwide, but most of them have never been tested for health impacts. So as the concerns about these adverse health effects are raised, the researchers are continuing to investigate the link between exposure to these chemicals and these different diseases and disabilities. And as I mentioned, with 50,000 research papers going on every year now, this mounting research is indicating that the health risks of exposure may far outweigh the benefits that we're deriving from using some of these chemicals. So I want you to notice that on the slides I have links and these links are important. This particular link goes to the Toxicant and Disease Database. And here on this link, they summarize, they tell you what the state of the evidence is. So in other words, fair evidence, strong evidence, and it talks about dozens of diseases and hundreds of different toxicants and how they are linked together. Now, let's go back to this indoor air. The studies are telling us that, that people spend only, and this just shocks me, but only two to 7% of our time outdoors. Two to 7% outdoors, and we're spending anywhere from one to 7% in an enclosed motor vehicle. The rest of that, the, the other 80 to 93% of our lives, we are spending indoor, indoors where most of our chemical exposure occurs. So uh, exposure from the things that are listed on the slide, such as the things used in the building industry, or even something as simple as when the automobiles, the emissions from running the automobile in the garage get into the home. So these toxins in our home can come from building materials, remodeling materials, paint, new carpeting. In fact, carpets can emit these volatile organic compounds, these VOCs. They can emit them for five years or even more. Of course, the, the off-gassing is gonna decrease after the first few months, but think about it, five years or more, and the off-gassing of this carpet alone can cause this particular matter that Brett was speaking of when we were talking about these uh, whisper vent vans and the serve uh, smart ventilation units. So these, this off-gassing causes that particulate matter to be suspended in the air for long periods of time. So this particulate matter is also called particle pollution. And what it is, is it's a mixture of solid particles and liquid droplets that are found in the air. And some of these particles, we can see particles like dust or dirt or soot or even smoke, but some of these others are so small that they can only be detected using an electron microscope. So Brett was mentioning particulate matter 2.5. So how small is 2.5? I want you to think about this. The average human hair measures about 70 micrometers. 70 micrometers is 30 times larger than particulate matter 2.5, 2.5 micrometers. Our human hair is 70. So you can see that that, we can't see that. We need that electron microscope to find it. So exposure to this particulate matter impacts our health. Think we're breathing it in and it contributes to, um, asthma, cardiovascular disease, and all kinds of other health problems. 
So these VOCs are in a family of compounds which most of the population were regularly exposed. And even though these don't bioaccumulate, they're not stored in our bodies, most of us are regularly exposed. Here on the screen, you're looking at five of the most common VOCs, and they're known as the BTEXS, as you can see by what they're called. Now recall that I was in the 80th percentile on benzene and styrene. That is just mind boggling. So these VOCs are emitted from a large number of household products. Remember, I'm using the safest household products. So you really, it was really quite um, mind boggling as to where I was being exposed. But we discovered it was an, an older automobile I was driving. And of course, driving with my window down in traffic. So I've learned some tricks along the way. But again, these VOCs are emitted from detergents and solvents and cleaning products and paint and varnish. And something as simple as burning a candle in the home can increase the benzene concentrations by 12%, depending on the type of the candle being used. So benzene is a chemical that's used to make other chemicals. So again, when you look at where it's used in manufacturing, I want you to think occupational exposure. So as we're talking to the building industry, you can see how working with these chemicals day in and day out can have an effect on your health as well as the health of the inhabitants who's going to live in that home as well as how it's affecting our planet because as persistent as these chemicals are in the body, they are equally as persistent in our water, in our land, and in our air. So the building industry has a tremendous responsibility to start looking more at this green home and Green Home Institute. We look at safety classifications for these chemicals and all of these different initials. This is five different agencies along with the American Conference of Governmental, um, et cetera. All of these agencies classify benzene as a known human carcinogen. Folks, a carcinogen is something that can promote cancer in the body. Ethylbenzene, this is another VOC. It's one of the top 50 chemicals produced in the United States today. Again, look at the occupation exposure. Fuel, asphalt, solvents, paints, varnish, rubber. Nearly 16 billion pounds of this chemical is produced every year in Texas and in Louisiana. Styrene, another VOC. We've got over 12 billion pounds of this also produced annually. Think again, exposure occupationally or someone living in the home afterward, rubber, fiberglass, resin, foam, plastic. In fact, styrene has been detected in drinking water and in the air of an, uh, an Alabama national forest. This stuff is everywhere. Now, what's interesting is the half-life of styrene in the body is anywhere from a half hour to four hours. Now, let me explain what that is. Whenever you hear the word half-life, that is the amount of time that it takes for one half of a chemical to degrade in, in somewhere, whether it's the land or the air or inside the human body, followed by sometimes a second, a third, a fourth, a fifth different half-life. But think about this, half-life of styrene in the human body is a half an hour to four, a half an hour to four hours, and then the second phase is anywhere from 13 to 30 hours. So if someone is being continuously exposed, it really never is able to leave the body fully, and these nursing infants can be exposed to styrene through breast milk. So again, we look at the safety classification of styrene. Uh, one agency calls it a possible human carcinogen, and two other agencies say that it's anticipated, reasonably anticipated, to be a human carcinogen. And what they wait for, folks, is additional information coming in. But when I see how close it is, that's something I want to avoid as much as I can. Now, toluene is, is ranked 25th on the list of top U.S. chemicals produced. 
So those again, with the highest occupational exposure are those who work in shoemaking, painting, printing, construction, and automotive production. The absorption of toluene takes place when we breathe it in. And when we breathe it in through inhalation, it then goes to the liver, the lungs, the brain, the kidneys, your adrenal gland, to the bone marrow, and to all the white fat tissue. It can pass through the placenta, it can pass through the breast milk. So again, really important to have knowledge of this so that we can take steps to protect those vulnerable populations. What they're looking at again is, and this is interesting to me, if you look in the bottom bullet point, it talks about how the EPA is categorizing it as inadequate evidence to classify. Now, what that means is they still need more information. There hasn't been enough uh, studies done to show that it's detrimental. But I can tell you this, that researchers are suggesting a, co a connection between miscarriages in women who are occupationally exposed to toluene, as well as fathers that have been exposed even when the mother has not been. So again, crazy stuff. They do know that exposure can increase ill effects on hearing and that higher doses of exposure and brain concentrations can predict some types of, um, I will call it neurotoxic behavior. Thylene, another VOC, it's one of the top 30 chemicals manufactured in the United States. In 2006 alone, they had eight billion pounds of xylene to make our fabrics, paint, varnish, rubber, and cleaning agents. Now the list of symptoms shown are, it's quite uh, intense, but if you look, it talks about in humans that no information currently available on carcinogens. Well, I gotta tell you, carcinogens, cancer is not the only problem. Someone who's walking around with a lack of muscle coordination or confusion or dizziness or ringing in the ears is suffering very much. So we can't always just go by whether or not it's carcinogenic. The noted health effects of these VOCs can also cause sleep disturbances. They, many of the studies report significantly increased risks of depression from moderate levels of exposure to VOCs. And when it comes to cardiovascular disease, styrene, benzene, xylene, a lot of these VOCs have also been um, implicated. Hexene, now this is a solvent that we use for varnishes and inks and glues as a degreasing agent. And there are several, several hundred million pounds of hexane produced every year in the US. The CDC, the Centers for Disease Control, has designated hexane as a neurotoxin. That means toxic to your brain and nervous system. Another chemical, methanol, it's found in many buildings. And here again, we have to consider these vulnerable, vulnerable, excuse me, vulnerable populations, these fetuses and children, because they are more susceptible to the effects of exposure to chemicals than adults because their organs have not fully developed yet. So we have to be really uh, mindful of those generations. Um, artificial fragrances. Typically, these fragrances contain other chemicals like parabens, and these help to uh, co uh, contaminate our indoor air and disrupt hormone processes in the body. Oftentimes, they put these fragrances in to mask the smell of the chemical. So it's, you know, they've masked the smell with something artificial, but now these artificial fragrances with the parabens and with the phthalates in them are affecting our body's hormonal processes. And absolutely, the phthalates have been shown to increase our susceptibility to weight gain, as I mentioned before, across the lifespan. So what are phthalates used for? 
Well, first of all, they were developed in the early 20s to add durability, transparency, and heat resistance to products that are manufactured from polyvinyl chloride. So now we're looking at a whole new set of phthalates, and my goodness, we like some of these things. We certainly like our furniture. We like the, the, the toys we can play with in the lake with our grandchildren and children. But these phthalates have problems. They can have birth defects with exposure uh, with the pregnant woman. And what we find is that a lot of the research coming in is showing that it can, can cause congenital heart disease. Now this really hit home for me because two of my three grandchildren were born with congenital heart disease. That is just crazy to me because that does not run in our family. And these phthalates are detected in landfill leaches in Germany, Italy, the UK, the US. These phthalates are found in jellyfish that are 3,000 feet deep uh, you know, in, in the ocean. It, it, and these phthalates are found 10 feet deep in the Antarctic snow. So just like in the human body, they too are, are bioaccumulative, or not bio, they're accumulative in nature itself. And they're released, these, these phthalates are released from plastic products. And again, we, we, we get them into our mouths, we inhale them, we, we have dermal contact, which means through our skin. Now, um, as you can see, the, the, the research coming in shows that it can have quite an effect, again, on the vulnerable populations, the children and the developing infants. Uh, they are, uh, they have properties that are called anti-androgenic, which means that they're altering male reproductive development. So we really have to become aware of what we are doing to this planet and really the building industry, how much responsibility falls on you because we're spending 80 to 93% of our lives indoors. And it's the materials that you're using to build these homes. Now, what we know is that with the phthalates, especially DEHP, this has been shown to have a negative effect on sperm. And the U.S. fertility rates have now fallen 45 percent since 1960. And males are now contributing to half of those infertility cases. So as I mentioned before, these, these phthalates are increasing our uh, our risk of developing obesity over the lifespan. They have found phthalates detected in 100% of children and almost 50% of adults today. Now these phthalates fall under the Toxic Substances Control Act. In the US, they remain unregulated in products and there are no regulations in place to mandate that it's even listed on the label. And yet in 2004, the European Union banned six of these phthalates. So we're a little bit behind in this country. And as far as the phthalate safety, you can see again, the different organizations that are saying, hey, we need to avoid this. This is an important link for you. And this is much like the other one that I gave you uh, from uh, uh, the, the Toxigenomics website. This is a link to the Collaborative on Health and the Environment. It's an excellent database that's gonna help you learn about the effect that these chemicals have on our body. And if you're working with these chemicals, I urge you to go to this website and check it out because you may be misdiagnosed with something that you are working with with your physician when the underlying cause might be an occupational exposure. Thanks for watching. Please continue to watch the next part of the session to complete the course and get your continuing education credits. Be sure to check out all of our courses available online that you can watch anytime and anywhere to pick up your CEUs. Before you go, make sure to subscribe to us on YouTube to get weekly updates and stay up to date on green building science courses, webinars, and home tours. Thanks again.